Well, my name is Elizabeth Noble. We are here to talk about unit testing today, and I am very appreciative that you are here to talk about unit testing on the last day of Summit, because that's normally uh, one of those dry topics that not everybody's super excited to talk about. So you guys are some brave souls coming here right before lunch to, to talk about unit testing. Before we get started, same slide you guys have seen most of Summit. Uh, please make sure that your cell phone is silenced. I will be honest, if it distracts me, it's gonna be really fun watching me get back on topic. So that's, that's the warning. I won't mess with you, I won't mess with your cell phone, but it'll be, it'll be a fun, fun experience for all of us. Most of you, I think they've, this is the first year that you could actually attend PASS and not join PASS, but most of us are PASS members. The membership is free. There's a lot of really great opportunities being part of the PASS community. There are local user groups, there are virtual chapters, there are SQL Saturdays. I started my journey at a local user group. Started going, uh, hung out for beers with other DBAs I knew. They very kindly tricked me into speaking at a SQL Saturday. It was not so bad. <laughs> and I think I've spoken at over 25 SQL Saturdays now over the last three years. So definitely something that can help your career, help you grow. All those big names, those blogs you read, you learn they're people, just like, just like the rest of us. Unfortunately, I wasn't brave enough to approach them until I started speaking, because I tend to get a little, little shy. But get involved, participate. You guys all have something to contribute, whether you think you do or not. We all have different experiences. There are also session evaluations. You have until next Friday to complete those session evaluations. It's my understanding there are daily drawings for gift cards. So there is an incentive to provide some feedback besides letting myself and other speakers know how we're doing, how we can improve our presentations for you. And with that, we will get on to the presentation. My name is Elizabeth Noble. I'm a database engineer, and I work at a company called Pull Apart. The important parts are I started life in business. <laughs> I have an accounting degree. I started as an operations analyst. That was, I wasn't even in IT at the time. Most of my work was writing code, fixing essentially code that had been deployed and was broken. And they had 40 of us at the company I worked at manually running scripts every day trying to fix the data so that our clients didn't know the application didn't work the way it ex was expected. And that's kind of, yeah, that's, that's kind of where I started really getting a passion for database code, for deployment process, was I didn't want anybody to go through that pain. It was honestly, it was a great opportunity. I was like every DBA's worst nightmare. I had like full read, write, execute, uh, all sorts of access, right? Like no DBA wants that. But I also wanted to learn SQL Server and that was the easiest way for me to do it. However, not everybody should have to live like that. So I'm a huge proponent of source control. If you don't like database source control, please come talk to me. I, I really wanna figure out where your perspective is because I've been through database deployments without source control and they're painful. <laughs> they're very painful, uh, yeah. I, uh, yeah, we won't get into that story. So I'm also, I like to say I'm a reform perfectionist. I'm not really a reform perfectionist because like many things, you're never not a perfectionist. So I'm trying, every day I'm trying, I wake up, I try not to be a perfectionist and I fail. And then I have to, you know, love the fact that I fail and it's a great, great thing. But I think a lot of us tend to be that way. We want things perfect. And that was kind of the other drive for me wanting to implement unit testing is when I would do a script review and I would let code through that caused a bug in production, I felt awful. Even if I didn't write the code, I was just like, oh my gosh, I've broken everything. <laughs> so that's really where this, this unit testing perspective came from is I was looking for ways not only to reduce my stress make my development easier, but also help my team members with those same challenges. So we've got a high level agenda. I'm kind of gonna go through hopefully some pain points you all are experiencing today. So things that you're, you're encountering in your deployment cycle, your development, kind of what challenges we're facing, why we haven't implemented unit testing maybe at this point or any form of database testing. And then we'll walk through some 
how to get started, getting some demos together, we've got a checklist, and then the conclusion. So before I get too far into this, how many people write code? I'm not gonna say developers, but okay. So like half the room, oh, almost like 80% of the room, okay. Out of the people that, well, let's start. How many people review code? Okay, about the same number, so about 80%. And most of you, how many people do both? Okay, perfect, perfect. So a lot of this came from wanting to improve that process, right? Not only wanting to improve my code, but improve the, the code of others. And that's, so then we get into the challenges, right? So we've got complex business logic. So where I work, pull apart, they have retail stores. So we've got different types of retail transactions. We've got sales transactions, we've got warranty returns, core returns, admission transactions, they're all stored in the same table because somebody really loves me. And then I've gotta figure out how to slice and dice those transactions differently. And sometimes, you know, depending on what department I'm working on, they want the transactions, they want two of the three types or all the types. And so I've gotta remember, you know, kind of like standing on one foot and juggling flaming swords or something, I have to remember how to do that. So I think most of us have dealt with a situation where we're having to keep track of all sorts of different business logic to write our code. And some of us, particularly we've been around for a while, we're really good at it. But one of the big challenges is onboarding. You know, you try to bring somebody new in, you try to explain to them all the ins and outs they have to go through, and it can be real challenging. So that complex business logic can really affect our code. Many of us, because most of us don't live in a perfect world, have application dependencies, right? So you've got one application, another application relies on it. I mean, I'm gonna be honest with you, we've got databases, putting it into source control was painful because we've got one database that references the other database, yes, and the other database that goes back and references that same database, right? So anytime you're developing for multiple applications or you're developing for a single application, you have to sit there and try to figure out, okay, now if I put this column here, what's it gonna do to that report over there? And nobody wants to keep track of that, right? Like we've, we've, got, we've got code to write. We've got better things to do than try to remember all the moving pieces. And that can cause, depending on the application, a fear of changing that code. How many of you guys have worked at a company where there's an application that's like black box, like nobody touches it? Right, right. <laughs> We've, that's about 50% of the room at least. I've, I've been there. Uh, so we're gonna see if unit testing can kind of help with that, kind of help that transition. Not passing script reviews. So I have, I have a nickname at work. Hopefully I won't get in trouble on the recording for this. It's not a swear word, but my nickname is Satan. Uh, it was given to me by my boss. I was told that I was a little too harsh with my script reviews as I'm sure most of you are familiar, when you're script reviewing code, you understand code. It doesn't need to go to QA to fail. You can sometimes read that code and tell, this isn't gonna work. I actually got to the point with the script review since I got in trouble, that I would go to QA and I'd say, hey QA, this script's gonna fail if you run it with this value. <laughs> and I'd go, do you want me to deploy it? Or do you want me to kick it back? And they'd go, oh, deploy it. Well, it took me like a year and a half to realize they loved deploying it because they would just go, bloop, bloop, fail. <laughs> He's like, you're making me look great. I mean, I didn't care because uh, my, my little catchphrase I've kind of developed this year is I just want good code. I, I don't care how we have to get there. I just want good code. And I, I will do my best to play nice to get good code. And that's really where the, the challenge of having those script reviews fail is that People put a lot of effort into their code. We all put a lot of effort into our code. And so when it doesn't work, when it constantly gets rejected and, and we feel like we're not doing good enough, sometimes that causes tension on our teams. You know, I did a script review recently and I asked a bunch of questions. That's what, that's what I do. I try not to kick it back with like red lines. I try to be like, okay, so when you were doing this process, what did you expect, like what was your thought process? Why did you put this column here? And the, the developer looked at me and he goes, well, I mean, if you like it, pass it. And I'm like, it's, it's not about like. I like you, you're a good guy. 
I just want good code. So we'll get into kind of some, some other ways that unit testing may be able to help with that sort of challenge. Legacy applications. This is really tied into that whole black box application dependency sort of perspective, is, is that it seems like every time we touch it, something else breaks. Can't touch the code. That's right, that's right, can't, can't touch the code. And oftentimes that legacy, that legacy application is the one that like the CEO relies off of, everybody, everybody lives for, right? So if you touch it and you break it, it's a really high level problem. We actually have a report where I'm at where, and it's not because, it's actually not because I broke the report, though I'm the reason that we have this policy, is any time we touch the report, we have to contact the CEO before we change it. Because it's used for employee bonuses, and when you change the numbers and it changes the employee bonuses, he gets a lot of phone calls. And he doesn't like those phone calls. So another thing to keep in mind, a lot of this can lead to angry or grumpy DBAs. So I asked how many of you develop code. <laughs> yeah, I, I was a lead database administrator before as a database engineer, and I've learned that there's a lot that goes with that title of database administrator. My developers were scared of me even before I started talking to them because they expected me to be this very grumpy, angry sort of person, and I really try not to be. But how many of you are DBAs out here? I saw a lot of developers. Okay, awesome, awesome. I'm so glad you guys are here. By the way, developers, I love you, but getting the DBAs to come to my sessions is very challenging. <laughs> so I'm very glad they're here. But it, it does create this cycle where the developers are trying their best, they're trying to put out code, they're trying to keep track of 14,000 things that are happening, and then the DBA gets the code or it goes to production and it's not working right, and the DBA feels like nobody's trying. Nobody's getting anything done, they're not testing things, it's just getting thrown over the fence, right? Like how many times have we heard the thrown over the fence phrase? So more code quality problems. And it's, it's not that people aren't trying their best, that's kind of what I've learned over the last couple of years is most of us, or almost all of us, wake up every day trying our best. That's what we wanna do, we wanna do our best. We wanna give our best foot forward. And I've, I've hinted at this a few times, that one application that no one wants to touch, that poor application, uh, usually it's overly complex or brittle, and so we end up with code quality problems there as well. So we all know we've got code problems, that's why we're here. We've got code problems, and it's okay. Like, usually it isn't even our code, sometimes it is. I've written some really lovely code. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we all do, right? So we all know we have code issues, but why don't we have testing yet? Why haven't we implemented testing? Oftentimes, we talked about legacy applications, application dependencies, black box applications that we can't touch or we're scared to touch. There are so many moving pieces to our businesses, right? I mean, my business has been doing what they're doing for over 10 years, which isn't even as long as many companies, but we've got over 10 years of technical debt, over 10 years of applications that have been developed. I mean, features that have been created and are deprecated and nobody knows they're deprecated. So trying to keep track, you know, like if I sat down and I was like, oh, I was like, oh I'm, I'm gonna start testing tomorrow. And then I'd go, oh my goodness, I can't believe how many tests I have to write. Well, never mind, I don't have, to our next point, I don't have time for that. My day-to-day -day job as a database engineer is actually, I, I kind of joke, I'm the, the ninja of the office. Whenever the management team needs a report turned around fast, an SSIS package created, something needs to, need to troubleshoot something, it usually ends up on my desk. Which means I don't have time to sit down and create 400 unit test scenarios. So I'm busy, I'm busy developing code, I'm busy fixing problems or solving production issues. We're not QA, I know, I'm a little, a little, little snarky here, but we're not QA. I mean, how many, how many people are here are QA before I go? Okay, thank you, thank you, QA. Uh, I appreciate you very much. I, I, love, I love using my business relationships with QA to help get my developers to write the code that I want. So it's perfect, it's a great relationship. But our, our experience ranges anywhere from, I'm not very good at testing stuff. If I was good at testing stuff, we wouldn't have QA, we wouldn't want QA. 
I mean, from my experience, QA is one of the, for most developers, they're, they're the, like the great hero, right? Because the developers get all the praise when the code goes out great. And if it goes out with bugs, then QA gets a hard time. So QA is always making the developers look good. But we may not have those skills to test our code. We may feel like it is somebody else's responsibility. And, and it can be QA's responsibility. That kind of depends on how you set up your framework. But you may not be familiar with how to test. The next one is, this is the biggest issue I've had, is I have difficulty getting buy-in from my management team. So my company uses source control. Did I ask how many of you use source control? It's a pretty good percentage, right? Perfect. So it's about at least 50. I think I did ask that earlier. When I first used source control, my managed my, like, the CTO was pretty much like, literally, we don't have time for that. <laughs> but I was the one, I went through this deployment process. We, it took us six months to deploy an application to our 25 stores. And throughout those six months, the code was constantly changing. And all of our code was in Jira user stories. Yeah, it was great, it was great. And one sprint, we had three user stories that touched the same stored procedure from three different developers. And I script reviewed all of them. So it comes deployment day, and I go, hey, which one am I going to deploy? And they looked at me, and they went, oh. I was like, you, you really want the DBA to decide what version of code we're deploying? That's, that's where we're at now? And that's when I was like, enough. So after we finished that deployment, we took a two-week sprint. Thankfully, uh, I got a, a manager in between me and the CTO to kind of help take the brunt of his frustration because he saw, he saw our JIRA board and he goes, what are all these user stories about source control? And it was like, we're going to go ahead and get that put in there. And we did. And we got two databases in source control, which let all of us realize how much, how awful it was when you don't have databases in source control because now we had both. But you've got to get that buy-in, and sometimes it's hard. I'm still learning how to prove the financials behind things, the numbers that the management wants to see. But that can be a challenge on why you haven't implemented unit testing yet. CI, CD. So I asked about source control. How many of you are doing continuous integration, continuous delivery? OK. About, I would say, 40%. So you may already have that process set up. You may already have it built out, maybe building your database projects. It may be deploying your database projects. But you might not have anything built in for testing your database projects quite yet. And it may be, how do we want to implement unit testing of our database projects? What method do we want to use? So that brings us to, all right, so we know we've got issues with our code, we know why we're not unit testing yet. But what are, what are we going to do to get there, right? Like, that's, that's the next step, is how do, how do we get there? That's hopefully why you're here today. So unit testing, which is the, the gist of, of this particular session, is a method of testing that allows you to focus on testing one piece of your application, one piece of your code at a time. How many of you are familiar with unit testing? OK, good portion. 80% or so, I'd say, maybe 90. For those of you that are new to unit testing, that's, that's the general concept, is we've got various types of ways to test our code. And that unit testing is going to let us have that granular focus, that focus on one particular aspect. So earlier, yeah? OK, so the, the, feed, the feedback is it's clear how to unit test a stored procedure. It's not clear how to unit test all of the other things. I'm going to guess those things are like, is it like functions and views or tables? No, it's, you know, it's schema changes, CML CTMs. It's you know, change, changing tables, changing data. OK, so changing tables, changing data, schema changes. There are uh, some unit testing functions for that. I'm not going to delve into those a whole bunch for this session. But I know that, uh, like the one that I was looking at, there's one for 
seeing if a table exists, seeing if the schema is the schema that you expect it to be. But some of that can bleed into, depending on how you design it, it can bleed into integration testing where you're actually testing how things interact. So if I want to unit test a stored procedure, as long as a stored procedure works, my unit test passes if it, if it meets my criteria. If the table underneath it has a column that got removed, but my stored procedure doesn't need it, that unit test will still pass because it's the, the stored procedure is separate from the table. Okay. It can also let you isolate your application dependencies. So we talked about having applications where they, yeah. Sure. Correct. So the, the feedback is if I remove the column and the unit test passes, okay, fine. But if I if the unit test needs that column and I run my unit test and the column doesn't exist, the unit test should still pass. So for the unit testing frameworks I'm familiar with, and I'll be talking about T SQL T, it takes a copy of the actual table. So if my table, my actual table, I drop a column, when it takes a copy of that table, it's gonna take a copy of that table without the column, and it's gonna run the unit test on that copy of the table. So integrating between the table structure and the stored procedure, which I think from a purely unit testing perspective uh, may, not, may not embrace the unit testing methodology, but I, I do think when you're dealing with databases, it tends to get a little tricky. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so isolating application dependencies. So we talked about the fact that there were applications that would be dependent one on another Unit testing lets you break that apart. So I'm not saying that you're gonna get rid of your application dependencies. What I'm saying is, kind of like the table stored procedures, what you can do is you can actually break apart, I'm gonna test the functionality of application A on this particular feature, and I'm gonna test the functionality of application B on this particular feature. So you still, the, the application dependencies outside of what you're working on will still exist, but your unit test will let you drill down and focus on one application at a time, instead of trying to juggle how those two applications will work together. The goal of this is that you'll start with one unit test. You'll build a test, a suite, or a collection of tests over time, and as you do that, your development process should get faster, because you're not gonna have to remember all the moving pieces. You're not gonna have to remember all the things that may break while you're writing your code, while you're making your tests. You're gonna have one unit test, 20 unit tests, 40 unit tests, and so as that unit test collection grows, you have the advantage of running those unit tests over and over again. So you don't have to remember all the things you fixed six months ago. The unit tests are gonna remember for you, as long as you created them. The goal of this is that you're gonna save time and money. So you're gonna save your time, all that time, spent developing, testing, solving production issues, hopefully some of that time is gonna go down. You're actually gonna end up with more time because you're not hopefully gonna be working on as many production issues because you're catching them with your unit tests. You're not gonna spend as much time manually testing your code because your unit tests are gonna have a lot of that manual testing built inside of them. The ultimate goal is that this is gonna allow you to improve your database code quality. So this is where a well-designed unit test will let you see that your database code is working the way that you expect it to work. 
and I put this one in here in code quality because I have seen this happen. The better code we're writing, the more code we're testing, the less bugs that are making into production, the more kumbaya everybody is in the office. And I, I told you my nickname is Satan, so they don't, they're not really certain that, that I'm all about the kumbaya, but I am. Like, I want to come in every day and have a good day. <laughs> I don't want to fight with people. I just want good code. Okay, so implementing unit testing, the good part. The first goal is to start small. So start small is not only, don't worry about the 400 unit tests you're thinking about right now that you need to go back to the office and create on Monday. It's fine. They'll, they'll get handled. But the start small is also when you look at your user story. So for, for those of us that primarily write T-SQL, we normally think in set-based transactions. We're normally thinking of how to handle large chunks of data and how to manipulate them, move them. Unit testing is a little different. It's, it almost takes that SQL thought process and turns it on its head because now you're trying to figure out one specific thing, one very little thing. So to not only focus on one thing at a time, but drill down into that stored procedure or that user story and figure out exactly what that user story needs when you start working on it. Focus forward. So as I said, don't worry about the 400 you haven't done yet. Start with the new one. Whatever user story, whatever ticket, whatever code you're writing next week, worry about that one and just that one. Just take that first step. Because you'll get there. You'll get that suite. You'll get all those unit tests together. It'll be all right. So unit testing is supposed to be a single piece of functionality, isolated, independent, repeatable. Um, I think we've already kind of covered. If you have a stored procedure that relies on tables, there is some dependency there. I think from, a, from my database world, I kind of put that all in one bucket. So as long as I'm not worrying about how report A is affecting application C, I'm, I'm putting that in the unit testing bucket. So the goal of unit testing, what you're really looking for is you want to confirm the functionality. You want to make sure that if you're getting a new task, making a new table, dropping a new column, that your code is working the way that you expect. So you can use this for new development. It's really great for solving existing bugs. If you're working on some production issue and you make a unit test for that production issue, that gives you the reassurance that in the future, you're not going to see that production issue again. Because I can tell you, I, I've been in environments where we've had branching and merging, you know, and they, they deploy code once, and everything's working great. And then two weeks later, they deploy the code again, and my bug's back. Whereas if that unit testing's out there, if it's part of that pipeline, that should catch that there was an issue with merging the code or whatever's caused that rollback to happen. And then the big focus with unit testing is creating your unit tests in a way that uses test-driven design. So the goal here is you want to make sure that when you run your unit test, it's doing exactly what you expect it to do. So it's a little counterintuitive, but the first time you create your unit test, you're basically going to create your unit test before you develop your code. So essentially, your unit test is going to be looking for a future state even before you make it. And when you run your unit test, your unit test should fail. The whole goal of having your unit test fail is that once you create your new code, once you alter that table or that stored procedure, and your unit test passes, you now know that you've successfully unit tested your code. So you're not getting a false positive. You're not getting feedback saying, oh, you did a good job. Your code's just fine when maybe there's an issue with the unit test. Got any questions about that? Okay. Kind of diving into unit testing, once again, kind of back to the more classic definition of unit test, uh, which I've even heard referenced around Summit this week, is that all unit tests are automated. I, I love to live in an automated world. I really do. And I can tell you, definitely with source control, before it was automated, nobody ever stuck with it. 
but there are ways to implement unit tests and gradually move towards an automated unit testing world and still start manual first. I know that it's not classic unit testing. I know that in terms of computer science principles, remember I have an accounting degree so I can cheat a little bit. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Uh, I know that that's not what people expect, but I, I'm of the opinion anything I can do for good code, right? So if, if starting with manual unit testing is gonna get me there first, I'm gonna try to get there first. Now, just like having manual source control the biggest challenge with manual unit testing is getting people to buy in and keep it up to date. So that's, that's a harder sell when you're not automating it, which is where I'm stuck. <laughs> so, so I understand. But if, you, if you're doing manual deployments, if you're running off of script files, if you don't have a dedicated test environment specifically to run unit tests, this may be an option. This may be something that works better for where you're at right now. The goal is automation. I'm, I think uh, Patrick LeBlanc, I heard him say it yesterday, I'm not lazy, I'm efficient. I'm trying, I'm trying to be efficient, right? That's my goal. So if, if you have your database code and source control, if you have a CI CD pipeline, where you have an available testing environment, these may be reasons for you to go ahead and automate your unit testing. You also have to think about what tools you wanna use. So this has to do with what what your teams are using. How many of you would identify as DevOps? Okay, wow, that is like a much smaller number. That was like maybe 15%. I'm, I'm super excited that you guys are using source control and not DevOps, like that's, that's awesome. What I found where I'm at, so we, I started as part of a DevOps team, even though I was the lead database administrator, is it's important to get everybody's buy-in on whatever you're implementing. So you go back to work on Monday and you're super excited and you wanna start unit testing on Monday. Well, I found if you don't figure out that the rest of your team prefers PowerShell to T-SQL or the rest of your team would prefer a GUI and you just charge forward doing your own thing, it makes it really hard to get that buy-in. Everybody's feelings are a little hurt. Uh, they, they wanted to vote, they wanted to participate. Maybe you've got a grumpy DBA that doesn't like the new process, whatever it is. So you wanna make sure that when you pick a tool, that you're, you're not only thinking about what's good for you, but what's good for your company. What, what skills does your company have right now? And it can be nobody's good at PowerShell and they all wanna be better at PowerShell. That's, that's an okay option. But think about that. You also wanna start thinking about how you're going to implement your code. So you wanna think about, are you gonna do manual? Is that okay? Or do you have to go straight to an automated unit testing methodology? You wanna figure out, is it okay to unit test as part of the build process? Or do you want to actually run those unit tests on a SQL Server instance? So there are different ways to handle that. So for instance, Visual Studio has unit testing built inside of it. It's got some C-sharp in it. Uh, I've created a unit test in Visual Studio. I don't know C-sharp. I still feel like I did a decent job creating a unit test. And for instance, in Visual Studio, I could do that as part of the build process. I didn't have to deploy anywhere else. So those are some things to think about. And these are kind of the options that I'm, I'm referencing. Is we've got Visual Studio in purple. We've got T-SQL-T, which is really what we'll be talking about today. It's a free framework built by some people in the SQL community. Uh, if you go to tsqlt.org, that's where you can get it. Um, and I, just to give a shout out, Sebastian has a Twitter handle of S-Q-L-I-T-Y. That's also, I think, his company's website for training. I have not met Sebastian, though I owe this presentation to him. Um, and I think Dennis Lloyd is the other developer that worked on that. So I like it because it's free. Whenever I'm trying to convince the business to embrace something, for me, it's easier to start with free. It's easier to start with something that doesn't cost the company money. There's also SQL test. From my understanding, SQL test is built on top of T-SQL T. It's more GUI based from my, my understanding. I'm getting a head nod of maybe not so much. Yeah. It's just a test writer for T-SQL T. Okay. I, I will say writing the code for T-SQL T made me want to pull my hair out a little bit. So I don't, it, I feel like it would be easier, not so much. 
Not so much. Okay. Okay, so it's really T SQL T. I think it is, is it part of their change automation suite though? Like you can put it in the whole pipeline? So that may be, if you're already using Redgate, then that may be one of the reasons to look at that. Yes? Okay. Okay, so it will write some of the T SQL T out for you. So it may be not uh, super handholdy, but somewhere in the middle. And then Pester, which if you were in the presentation in this room, right before um, they were using Pester for unit testing in PowerShell, it's more of a PowerShell based one. I haven't quite figured that one out, but I'm still a newbie in the PowerShell world. So those are some things to think about when you're considering how you want to implement unit testing. So since we're gonna work with T SQL T, I'm gonna kinda walk through what's needed to implement T SQL T. You're gonna wanna go download T SQL T. I will update my demo, however, I will not put the real T SQL T in the demo slide. Uh, that's so that I will give you a reference to go download it. That's part of the deal uh, with, with using T SQL T as part of the presenting is to make sure that that traffic is going back to the, the T SQL T uh, developers. You need to enable CLR, that's part of the part and parcel of T SQL T. And I did recently read a blog post, it's actually a couple years old on the tsqlt.org. You do not need to set the database to trustworthy any longer. However, I'm gonna do that because I haven't updated my slide deck yet, but there is a blog post on tsqlt.org on how, how to get around that and, and kind of help your database be a little more secure. Both of these should kind of be indicators that you want to be careful. You do not want this going to your production environment. This is specifically intended for your development environment. So the code, it will be in the slide deck, and just, you know, this is an updated slide deck from the one that was originally submitted. They're reviewing it, and once they get it approved, it'll be out there and available for you to download, so you'll still have the code available. But you're gonna execute SP configure, CLR enabled to true, and then reconfigure, and then for our demo, we will be altering the database and setting trustworthy to on. The real file that you're gonna want from tsqlt.org is this tsqlt class.sql. It's a really long file. I'm gonna be honest with you. I have not read every line of that file. It is a lot of code. I would say if you, if you want, go through, read it. It's, it's a lot. <laughs> but it's, it's essentially where that tsqlt framework is coming from. So if, Feel free to, to kind of peruse it, see what's in there, and, and get a better understanding of how that works. And with that, yes? Uh, is it possible to put the uh, enabling of trustworthy inside the setup of, of each test? Is it possible to enable trustworthy inside each test? I think I'm getting some head shakes of no. Yeah, so one of the options, which is what I was uh, trying to, to work through, and I, I've heard some people do, is they actually put T SQL T in a separate database. Uh, okay. So they isolate the unit tests from the actual user databases. And that does make managing the, managing the unit tests a little trickier, but it is an option. Yes? I am not certain. That is correct? Is that what I heard? Yes. Okay. Is that Sebastian hiding back there? <laughs> Hi, Sebastian. <laughs> Should make you stand up and take a bow. Thank you, by the way. So now that, uh, now that there's no pressure at all, <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and, and walk through the demo of setting this up. It's okay, it's perfect. Okay, so I've got a little cleanup script. I'm not actually expecting it to run correctly, but it's really how I start over. Oh, thank you. I had it, I had it on duplicate, and it just doesn't like me. Nothing needs to be fixed. <laughs> yes, uh, I try to tell myself that every day. Okay, now you got my lovely screen. Okay. So we'll 
zoom into this code. I have this set up mostly just so it, if I have the database out there, it drops the database. It'll go ahead and undo some of the configuration stuff. So it's really just a start from scratch kind of thing. And I did not have the database out there, which is why it yelled at me. So step one, enable CLR. Not so bad. I did find when I was running SQL Server 2017, I not only needed to enable CLR, but I had to disable CLR strict security. Once again, using this in, a, in my personal environment, please do your, your due diligence before doing as I do. And that is successful. So we can see that my CLR strict security is disabled. And that should be it for this part. Oh, we'll go ahead and create the database. So we're going to create the database. I'm really exciting, so I love budgeting. Don't ask me why. I do it in Excel all the time. I'm so ashamed to say that, so I need to grow up and have a database. So that's partly where this comes from. And then I've got a command line here to alter the database and set trustworthy to on. So we will refresh over here. Hope I remember my zoom it. There we go. Used to zooming in on videos. So we've got a database. It doesn't really have a whole lot going on. And we'll switch back to the demo real quick. I knew that was too easy. OK, so we've gotten our database ready. We haven't installed T SQL T yet, but we'll do that shortly. Once we install T SQL T, we need to start thinking about what types of unit tests we're going to create. So there's this option for new test class, and what it does is it allows us to group our unit tests together. So we can group our unit tests either by application or database or purpose, or we can just have one, one large generic bucket. But this is a key part of making sure that when you create your unit tests that T SQL T knows, knows where they are, what to do. And then once you start, once you have your test class, you're going to want to create stored procedures that begin with the word test. And that's how T SQL T knows that that's supposed to be a unit test. So we'll, we'll work through creating some of those examples. Most of what I've focused on in my unit tests is comparing results. So I'm trying to make sure that my stored procedure results match what I expect them to be. And for that, I'm taking advantage of two tables within T SQL T, actual and expected. For those of you that are familiar with it, they operate somewhat similarly to the inserted and deleted, where they're not like tables you're going to see in Object Explorer, but you can go ahead and use them for comparison purposes of your test results. Now my favorite thing that I'm using mostly because I'm comparing those actual and expected tables is the assert equals table. So that lets me compare both the expected and the actual one to the other. And we will walk through creating some unit tests. So as I said, we'll uh, zoom out of this a little bit, not too much. And then to give you an idea, there's like this teeny tiny bar over in the right. This is all the hard work that has gone into this. It's a whole bunch of code. So this is what you're going to run to create that T SQL T framework in your database. For me, I've learned the hard way. If I don't specify my use statement at the top of my script, I end up with a lot of things in the master database. And then when I do that in production, I'm scared to take them out. So they live there 
until we migrate to a new server. <laughs> yeah, it's great. And then we get a nice message telling us, thank you for using T-SQL-T and the version that we have deployed. I'm gonna go ahead and refresh the database. We're gonna see, and I will zoom in. I just wanted to get it queued up. So we've got tables within here. We should, I think we have some views, yeah. So there is a whole bunch of stuff that that framework just created for us. Stored procedures. So there's a whole bunch out there. You guys could lose several lunch hours exploring T SQL T. So is Rob just created there? Mm -hmm. If I ever wanted to map them back to my source control, is that the question? Yes. I don't want them in source control. Okay. However, I'm also a fan of state-based migrations. So then you gotta kinda gotta juggle making sure you don't drop objects that aren't in source control if you're gonna keep them in the same database. Otherwise, yeah, put them in a, a separate database and that can make your life a little easier I will have to talk to Sebastian later because I, I do have plans for how to automate the deploying of it, and I don't, I'm not entirely certain right now how to do that without putting it in source control. I've done this with database projects, uh -huh. and you, you are use database directly. Mm -hmm. uh, same database, same state. Okay. So it's like an inheritance model where you write the unit test and then it tests the database that inherits the model of the state. Okay. And Okay. It's really slick. You, you, you have to decide which database you want. So the one with the test or the one without the test. But they all inherit the same. Okay. So I think I think we need to talk about that afterwards. But it sounded like having two different versions of the same database project, and then having one with the references for T SQL T and one without, is an option. I was I was looking into how to have T SQL T in one database in the project and then have my user database and a separate database in the project, which would let me control which databases I deployed to which environments, but that can also make things tricky. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and create a table. So we've gotten T SQL T framework all together. So we're gonna start working on some unit tests. So I've created the table budget. It's got some columns, vendor, vendor ID, address, city, state, zip code, payment date. I'm gonna go ahead and close out of this one. So my next one is I'm gonna make a test class. So that's where I told you that we're gonna use test classes to group our unit tests together. So in this case, I'm testing the budget app. So I'm gonna make a test class specifically for the budget app. And we can even go over, I think we can see that. Shrink all this down. Insecurity. Yep, right there. Test budget app under the schemas as well as T SQL T. <laughs> All right. So I started this unit testing process as a very untrusting DBA. So I figured, usually the hardest sell is database administrator. How do you convince the database administrator that the tool that you've given them is doing what you expect it to do? So I decided, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna test this, this framework out. I'm gonna see how smart it is. So I'm gonna make a table DBO vendor, a fake table, which is a 
copy of that DBO vendor table. And I'm going to run this stored procedure post vendor, which is supposed to insert some records into that vendor table. So I've gone ahead and I've specified after I run that post vendor statement, I'm going to pull the data from the vendor table and save it as my actual results. So, okay, I'm making a copy of a table. I'm going to insert some data into the table. I'm going to query that to get my data back to see that the insert actually happened. And then I'm going to go ahead and create my expected table. These are the results that I want to have. And I'm going to specify exactly what those results are. And I'm going to save those results into the expected table. So my end result is I'm going to compare my expected results and my actual results. So that's my goal. Part of the reason I did this, I see some, some faces out there that are looking at me like I'm a little crazy. I, I did do this on purpose, right? So I wanted to prove if I have a stored procedure that doesn't exist, what does T sequel T do? If I'm trying to execute a stored procedure and I haven't created it yet, is it going to yell at me or is it going to let it pass? Because this was, once again, grumpy DBA hat trying to prove that I was, I was comfortable with this, I could get buy-in from other people, that, that this unit testing methodology would help make sure that I wasn't thinking code was working the way I wanted when it wasn't. So I get this nice message. It tells me that the module test that post vendor inserts a vendor depends on the missing object dbo.postvendor. So if I had had my coffee this morning, I'm already getting told that what I'm doing isn't going to work. But I'm busy. I've got, you know, two people behind me asking me questions. A developer just came in and interrupted me. So, okay, fine. I'm, I'm not really paying attention. <clears throat> so I'm going to try to run that unit test. So under stored procedures, let's see if it lets me, there we go. We've got a couple different run options for running the unit tests. So we've got T sequel T run, run all, run C, run new, run test, run test class. We've got a whole bunch. By default, I typically use the T sequel T run all. I want to make sure that everything that I'm trying to run is running the way that I expect. So I make a new query. And we'll see what happens. So I've got some, some red text here. So I ran this unit test. The stored procedure didn't exist. So what happened? Well, I have a failure message up here, and it tells me it couldn't find the stored procedure, which lines up perfectly with this red text below telling me that my unit test has errored. So not only did I not pass, I have an error. So I'm, I'm not, even, not even at square one yet. So we'll close out of that one. And let's see. So, okay, so I'm getting a little more confident. I've proven to myself that if I have a stored, if I'm, if I have a stored procedure in my unit test and I don't have it and it doesn't exist, the unit test isn't going to let me do anything. So I wouldn't call that a true failing condition. But let's see if we can make that a little bit better. Okay, so I'm going to make a stored procedure, and I'm going to have it select some values. I'm not going to have it actually insert any values. Because once again, I'm still a, little, still a little hesitant. I'm still new to this whole unit testing thing. I want to make sure that I'm comfortable with how the process works. So I'm going to go ahead, and I've changed it just to do a select statement. And then when I execute it, I get a failure. 
So my failure is unexpected missing results at rows. And that's really what this message below here is telling us, is it's telling me I expected to have these values, but my unit test didn't have those. So we're not matching. And that's because my stored procedure isn't doing what it's supposed to be doing. It's selecting something, it's not inserting anything. So, okay, enough fun and games. We'll, we'll do real work now, right? I've had, I've had three cups of coffee this morning. My boss may be wondering why I'm playing with unit testing all morning. So I'm gonna show everybody that I'm, I'm doing something effective and I've got, I've got this unit test stuff down. So I've gone ahead, I've changed the procedure and I'm inserting into that table DBO vendor with the, val with the parameters from the stored procedure. So we will give this unit test one more run. And there we go. We have a successful unit test. So this is where if you don't have continuous integration, if you don't have your environment set up for source control, this is where I would start. I would start with finding a place to put the T-SQL T framework, writing that code, writing those test classes, writing those, those unit cases, and come up with a process, you know, that when people work on their code, they need to run that T-SQL T run all as part of their process. And heck, have them, have them copy and paste this right here and put it in the comments of their Jira user story or you know, attach the output somewhere so that you've got proof that everybody's buying into this process. Because the best part about buying into a manual process is that people don't like manual processes, but if they find how useful it is, they're gonna wanna continue moving towards automation. So let's see here. So we'll go over our checklist. I'll stand back up so that people can see me since I am short. All right, so the first thing you wanna do when you're considering unit testing is you wanna consider what tools you're going to use. So think about what languages you use, how your business works, how you want to deploy your unit test. Do you wanna have that as part of a build process? Do you want to deploy separately to a, a separate server, whether that's Azure, or whether you've got a fully dedicated test server, how do you wanna do that? And then you're ready to move towards building your first unit test. When you create your unit test, you're gonna start with designing your unit test to fail so that you don't get any false positives. So you're gonna create your unit test first, you're gonna design it to fail first, and then you're gonna work on making those code changes. Once you make those code changes, run your unit test again. Once you run your unit test again, see if it passes. If it doesn't pass, you've got more work to do. You've got, you've got to do this whole process over again. You also wanna confirm your code changes. So that's where you're gonna update that database code and run your unit tests and repeat that process till it happens. So the overall flow is decide you want a unit test, start thinking about what coding languages you use, think about whether you're gonna use automated or manual deployments, think about whether you're going to run your unit tests as part of your build process, if you're gonna deploy those unit tests to a different server, once you get that all figured out and you've got everybody bought in and you've, you've gone ahead and deployed your, your unit testing framework or set up your pipeline is when you're ready to start writing your first unit test. And when you do that, you're gonna wanna set up your unit test to fail. You're gonna go ahead and run that unit test, confirm that your unit test is failing so that you know where you started at, then go make your code changes. So that's gonna cause a little bit of change in process. You know, I mean, I know when I get a new user story, particularly if I'm excited about it, I wanna dive right in and start writing code immediately. So this is kind of a step back in terms of, it lets you take some time to sit and think about what you're going to work on, which I'll tell you, when I first started working with user stories, I found user stories very difficult to put a sentence together 
but the more I've worked with them, the more I've realized that it helps me understand what problem I'm trying to solve. And the same thing with unit testing. As unit testing, when you take those extra steps to figure out what you want your unit test to look like and build it out, that's gonna help you be more effective at writing your code. And then, I know we talked about, uh, the session abstract talked about automating unit testing, and that's really where, where the goal is to go towards, is to, is to automate those unit tests. So there are various options available. I looked into several of them preparing for this presentation. Uh, my company is currently, we actually just did a big switch. We were using Team City and Octopus Deploy as part of our build and deployment process. <laughs> Uh, we, have a, we have a little issue, so we are now on Azure DevOps and Octopus Cloud. There is um, something on the marketplace in terms of Azure DevOps for implementing T-SQL T unit testing, and I know there's a blog on tsqlt.org about integrating uh, with some other options. So there are options out there to automate your unit tests. I think our main focus is probably gonna be creating a server where we go ahead and deploy those unit tests to a separate server, run those unit tests separately, and then continue on in our uh, deployment process. So the real focus is good code, right? So we started, we know what issues we have. We've got legacy code, we've got complex logic, we've got application dependencies, all of those make it really difficult for us to write good code and keep everything together. A lot of times we want to implement testing, we want to implement automation, but it's difficult for us to do, and that's partly because we don't have the time, we don't have the buy-in, we may not have the skill set. So that's where you're gonna to wanna to focus on implementing changes slowly, start small. Start with picking a unit testing framework, pick one user story, maybe have the whole team work on it together to kind of get everybody on board with what the process is. And that will help you move forward in the unit testing. And if you're gonna use something like T-SQL-T, I've shown you it's, it's pretty easy to install and set up and get your first unit test together. And that's a, a good framework to start with that then you can move forward in terms of automating and improving your deployments. So you're gonna wanna choose a unit testing tool, set up that first unit test, and then what you'll get over time is you'll get a collection of tests over time that you can go ahead and run. And that should help you get better code quality, deploy faster, deploy better, improve peace and harmony in the office, hopefully. <laughs> and yes. I'm not aware. Okay, so the question had to do with SQL CLR and whether T SQL T would work in cloud providers, which it seems like it will work in Azure. Is there? Yeah, that was, that was okay. Okay, so from, from Sebastian, T SQL T runs on Azure SQL databases. Okay, are there any, any other questions? Yes. So the, the question is, the stored procedures that are in your database, you wanna make sure that they're going to execute correctly. Successfully. successfully, successfully. I can say, so is your database in source control? Yeah. Is it in SSDT source control? No? no it is. Okay, so oftentimes the build on that will catch certain things. 
Yes. I, I would say you should be able to do that. I know of someone in the SQL community, Paul Waters, who actually used T-SQL-T to migrate, I believe, all of the reports from one version of report server to another, and he kind of came up with a systematic way so that he didn't have to manually redo every single step. So I would, I would definitely say there's a way to do that. I'm just not entirely certain how to implement that. Yes? So the, the question has to do with test data, sorry. Okay, so the, the question has to do with test data and do you want to create a collection of test data that you start with and then clean up after you finish or do you want to have the test data piece by piece for each unit test or whatever you're, you're working with? I think in terms of at least what I'm used to dealing with with unit tests, they operate better piecemeal. However, my company also has very, I mean, we have 300 reports in SSRS. And like I said, the, the, the biggest issue with that report is how many moving pieces are in that report. So I would say having per unit test data makes sense for the unit test because the unit test, nobody's really looking at the data in the unit test other than the, the framework usually. However, I did talk to Steve Jones and, and he's a big fan of curated data, which I think in terms of those complex applications, when you're dealing with those application dependencies and you're kind of getting into that functional integration testing, having a curated set of data really helps you know what data to expect, right? So if I have the same set of sales transactions every single time I test my data, I know that my report should always be $300. So when I look at my report and it says $310, I know there's something wrong. And I don't have to worry, I don't have to do the math because my numbers are consistent when I look at them. Let me get him first and then I'll. I heard common things across tables. Okay, so the, the question is, if you've got a series of tables and a series of schemas, would you, would you test that each schema had a table within the same unit test? Is that, did I understand it correctly? So, so to be more authentic to unit testing, you would have each of those separate. So you'd have each, if you wanted to make sure that every single table you had had a, a stored procedure associated with it, you would make one unit test per table to check for that. Yes? Um, yeah, question about fast legacy data. So you have um, legacy data that maybe you have embedded in primary schema or you know, a range of artifacts that on a go forward basis you can still point to schema as your code. So I would, I would think you could, so it's the same table or different tables? Okay, so the, the question is, I've got legacy data. The legacy data is not in the state that I want it to be. And I know that I'm stuck with it. How do I make certain that when I'm doing my unit tests, it's not continuing that bad habit of the legacy data? 
So my experience with T-SQL T is that it's not even really worried about what data is in your table. It's when, it, when, when you run the unit test, it's actually taking almost like a snapshot, not really, but it's taking a copy of that table somewhere else and working with it. So when you're doing your unit test, it doesn't care that you have a negative one. So it, you should be able to work around that since it can kind of ignore the fact that that data exists already. Okay. And the legacy would still have a unit test that will not work. So I'll repeat that. So create a unit test that checks to make sure the stored procedure doesn't have a negative one and include that in your unit testing suite. All right, Sebastian. Okay, so Sebastian's feedback was that's two questions, or two, two unit tests. One to, one to make sure bad data isn't continuing to happen, and one to make sure we can continue to handle the bad data, right? Okay. All right, well, thank you. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Noble. You can follow me on Twitter, email me. As I said, the slides are available, so feel free to reach out. And thank you for attending, and I hope you have a good summit.